you brought a Bible with you, you can open with me to the book of Acts chapter 3. The book of Acts chapter 3. And we are um, in a series uh, simply called Revival. Just kind of looking at the move of God in the book of Acts. What that looks like. What that sounds like. What happens when God moves among his people. Also understanding that God is still moving in our lives. He's still moving in our generation. Can I have a better amen right there? I know you're trying to find Acts right now, but it's the truth. God is still moving in our generation, and uh, despite uh, what things look like around us, and no matter how dark it may be getting in the world around us, we have the blessing, we have the opportunity, we have the privilege, and we have the responsibility of being the salt and the light of the world right now. You do know that, right? As the church, we aren't called to hunker down or to back up or go live in a cave somewhere. We're called to be strong. We're called to be mighty. We're called to stand up. We're called to be the light. We're called to be the ones who preach truth, to be pillars of the truth as the church, right? That's who we are uh, called to be. And so we've taken a little time and, and seen what God does as he moves in the book of Acts and moves in their midst and how he's moving in our midst. And so... Uh, today we're going to look at Acts chapter 3, and if you're wondering if we looked at Acts chapter 3 last week, you would be correct. Um, if you're wondering if I've preached from Acts chapter 3 like four or five times during this series, you would also be correct, all right? Um, but we are back at it again, Acts chapter 3, and uh, beginning with verse 1, and look through a few, a few verses together. Are you ready? Anybody pumped? Anybody leaned in? Anybody on the edge of their seat? Do I have an amen corner anywhere in the world right now? Hallelujah. Do not leave me up here by myself. We're in this thing together for the next few minutes. Some of y'all a little bit nervous, like, well, they're not singing another song. The offering's not happening. Pastor has more time to preach. And I know that's what you're excited about. I know that's what you're excited about. Acts chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, and he was there to ask alms, or you could say he's really begging for money, uh, from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. This is what he said to the man. Look at us, verse 5. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And the church said, Amen. All right, so we have an absolutely miraculous, supernatural event that happens right here. We have Peter and John. We just read it. They're going to church. They're going to go pray. They see this guy. He's been there probably more than once, probably been there for a long period of time over his lifetime, all right, probably brought there on the regular. And Peter and John walk uh, up to him, and, and so they, they tell this particular man to look at us, Peter says. Look at us. Now, of all the things that Peter and John had, of course, they had the Holy Spirit. They had been with Jesus. There's a lot of good things that Peter and John had. There's something about this moment that I want to capture today. And it was confidence. It was boldness. It was authority that they had in that moment. I mean, think about the confidence it would take to tell a man who's asking for money to look at you knowing that you did not have any money in your pocket. Look at us. And he expecting to receive what? Something, right? A dollar, five dollars, a quarter, a nickel, a penny. Expecting to receive some sort of money from them. He looked at them with expectation. And then Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then in another step of faith and boldness and confidence, he grabs a man by the right hand like, here we go. Not like, I hope this works out for you. I prayed a nice prayer for you. Not like we'll catch you on the flip side. Not like we'll see you tomorrow. Like, let's do this right now. 
And there's something about the disciples of Jesus that they carried. And it was this, this confidence, this boldness, this authority that they knew that they had because of who they had been with and the authority that he had given to them. In fact, when they were being questioned by the religious leaders of that day, the religious leaders said, look, we, we know you're not learned. We know you're not educated the way that we have been in studying scripture, but there is still something about you that is just like Jesus. We can tell you have been with Jesus. There's an authority that you have. There's a power. There's a boldness that you have. And I believe uh, that Peter and John shouldn't be the only disciples who follow Jesus who carry that boldness. I believe I believe God's called us as a church, as the church, as the people of God to have a confidence, to have a boldness, and to walk in authority and a dominion that is given to us and has been given to us as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter and John, they had seen Jesus walk in authority, right? He taught with authority. He demonstrated his authority. Come on. He, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. He made the blind to see. He walked on water. There's even one time when he rebuked the wind and the waves. And the wind and the waves obeyed him. It actually says that he spoke to the wind, spoke to the sea. I mean, this is some real confidence and boldness and authority that Jesus walked in. The disciples, when they saw him do that, they were like, who is this man? Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? There was a boldness and a confidence and authority that Jesus walked in that he transferred to his disciples. Something that he wanted his disciples to walk in. In fact, he gave them his name to use, right? He gave them his name to use. In Luke chapter 10, I believe it is. You can turn there if you like. Luke chapter 10, Jesus has sent out his, his disciples plus a few, it's like 70 of them, sent them out two by two, tells them what to do, tells them the power and the authority that they have. They come back after seeing the power and authority being released from them. They are pumped, they're excited, they're filled with joy that the demons are trembling and being cast out in his name. And Jesus says this in Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. He said to them, to these disciples who've returned, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Uh, the Amplified Bible says, like a flash. Come on, anybody this week, you saw the lightning in the skies this week? I, mean, I was driving uh, Friday, and, and I saw the lightning shoot across the sky, and I'm like, just like the devil got shot out of heaven. Praise the Lord, right? He's saying, look, when, when Satan, like, popped up his rebellious head, he's like, look, the power of God is no match for the power of the enemy. He got kicked out just like that. Amen. So he's like, it's really not that big a deal that the demons are subject to you in my name, all right? Even Satan, even the devil, like even with all of his power that he has, is no match for our God. It's no match for my name, right? Then he says this, and I love this. He says, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So look, all right, let's get a little perspective here. Satan got kicked out like lightning, but I want you to know something, all right? The authority that I have, and we know that Jesus said that he had all authority and power in heaven and on earth. He says, that authority and that power that I have, I'm transferring to you, my disciples. How many you know, as the children of God, as the people of God, as the people whose faith is in Jesus, who've been born into the family of God, we don't have less authority and less power than Peter and John had back then and there. In fact, we have the Holy Spirit here and now to help us. Amen. He says, I give unto you the authority, the authority. Amen. That should let you know something about the boldness and the confidence that you should have when you deal with your adversary, when you deal with the enemy, when you deal with the devil, when you deal with the powers of darkness. There should be an authority, a boldness, a confidence, a triumphant victory that you should have in your voice. Hallelujah. Knowing that Satan has been defeated. Hallelujah. My dad, I like the way he says it like this. He goes, Satan knows more about his defeat than most Christians do. Isn't that the truth? He was there. <laughs> he was whooped. He knows he's whooped. But most Christians kind of walk around like, ooh, oh, I'm kind of afraid of what the devil's doing. Oh, it's 2020. Who knows what August is going to look like? I'll tell you what August is going to look like. It's going to look like grace. It's going to look like help from the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
It's going to look like right on time, present God working in my life. And no matter how bad or dark it gets or whatever else hits the news, guess what? We still have God on our side. He's still working with us, in us, for us. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at all the devil's doing. But look at our God. He's greater. Hallelujah. And James 4, it says it like this. James chapter 4, verse 6, 7. I'm preaching pretty good for a white guy at 10 o'clock service. If only I could sing that song. My God is real. My God is real. For I can feel him in my soul. Hey, that wasn't that bad. Come on, y'all. That's about a little Barry White coming out. James chapter 4, verse 6, 7 says, but he gives more grace. Oh, thank God for that. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You don't want to be resisted by God. We won't be in the, in the receiving of God's grace crowd, right? Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Therefore, submit. Humble yourself before God. And I believe there's a connection between your authority and your submission. It's important that we're submitted to God. There's a lot of people who try to use the authority that they have, but they're not submitted to God at the same time. He says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that, that word resist just stood out so strong to me the past few days as I've been preparing for this Sunday. Resist. Somebody say resist. Resist. The Passion Bible says it like this. It says, stand up to the devil and resist him. Stand up to the devil and resist him. The devil's kind of like a bully. He's going to keep taking your lunch money if you let him. Now, when I was a kid, I had, had something that I loved to ride. And it was my, my big wheel. Anybody had a big wheel when you were kicking? Do we have a picture of the big wheel? If you can put it on, on the screen. Jude sent me a link to this during service. Like, thank you, for Jude. I, and I like that one. It's got little flames on it, you know. Come on, honestly, anybody have one of those big wheels in your kid? You're like, dear God, I wish I had one right now. How many know they make adult big wheels? They do. Every time I preach this and use this illustration, somebody sends me a link, but they refuse to order it for me. Hallelujah. I don't know what's up with that. But I had, I had a big wheel when, when I was a kid, and I'm telling you what, and I can remember. And, and I remember those big wheels. I mean, you just, you just you know, you're going real fast, fast as you can, and then you, you cut it, man. You cut it, and you're like, shh. Hopefully you do it right. You can like get a good spin going on. If you're in the garage and the concrete's real smooth, you're like, you like spin it around, man. It's good times, y'all. Good times, right? You know you're a big time, big wheelie guy when you when you wear out the middle of that wheel. Come on, anybody wear out the middle of that wheel? It's like, oh yeah, I've been doing some work on my big wheel. You know what I'm saying? So I had a big wheel. Love my big wheel. And when I was just a kid, I don't know how old I was, probably seven or eight years old. We were living in West Columbia, Texas at the time. And so I was outside playing on my big wheel, and someone bigger than me in our neighborhood knocked me off my big wheel and took my big wheel, y'all. Wrong, just so wrong. So you know what I did? I started crying. Walked into the house. Started telling my dad because I was hoping my daddy going to do something about it. I go inside and like, Dad. Dad, they, there's a kid out there that knocked me off my, my big wheel. Dad's a, and you got to know something about my dad and just give a little, like, help here. He's from Texas, all right, and he don't play with stuff like this. Like, he's a very, a very bold, confident, and somewhat aggressive man at times. And so he, he said, Aaron, whose big wheel is it? It's, it's my big wheel. He said, you just let them take your big wheel. Yeah, and I'm thinking, I'm hope he's going to come outside and help me out with it. He goes, I'll tell you what to do, son. All right. He said, let me see your hand. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to ball it up like this. Okay. And I want you to put your thumb right there like that. And he said, I want you to go out there, and I want you to punch that, punch that bully right in the nose. Now, I'm not saying uh, advocate for violence in the neighborhoods, okay? So let me just be clear. I'm not saying, all right, because I was taught not, not to do that. I'm a lover, not a hater. All right, y'all with me on this? All right, if I ever hit my sister, I got, I got my butt whooped. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't, we don't do all that. But it, there was something about this moment that was significant to my life. So he said, I want you to ball up your fist like this, and I want you to come on. So I, so I, I went out. I walked out the door. 
Walked out the door, I balled up my fist just like this, put my thumb like that, and I punched that dude right in the nose. Wham! Bam! You know what? He got off my big wheel, y'all. He got, I got on my big wheel. Come on. Those tears, you know, when you cry and you're all dirty, you got those dirty tears, you know what I'm talking about? The dirty tears, wiping the dirty tears off, and I'm riding my big wheel around the neighborhood doing my spins, man. I am living the good life, and I want you to know in 2020, the devil's trying to take your big wheel. Maybe your big wheel is your peace. Maybe your big wheel is your joy. Maybe your big wheel is the blessing that God has called you to. Maybe your big wheel is the promise that God has given you. Maybe your big wheel is your health. I want you to know, do not allow the enemy to knock you off your big wheel. There is peace that comes from heaven. There is joy that is your strength. There is health that comes from the Father God because of what Jesus has done for us. I'm telling you, do not let the enemy knock you off your big wheel. Somebody get your hand up just like this. Ball it up. Just come on. Some, come on, y'all. Ball it up just like that. If anybody's sleeping, punch him right in the shoulder right now. Just punch him right in the shoulder. See, I've been, I've been waiting, to, waiting to punch them for a long time. Hallelujah. Stand up to the devil. Now is not the time to get in the fetal position and hope this just passes. Now is not the time for the church to just back up or the people of God to just hope everything turns out all right. Now is not, and look, we need hope, don't get me wrong, but we have to stand in our authority. We have to, look, there's a reason a few minutes ago when we're praying, we're declaring things over our city. We're declaring things over our community. We're declaring things over people at the house right now who aren't feeling well. We're declaring things over people in the hospital. We're declaring things over you. Why? There is power when we declare the word of the Lord. There is power when we release the authority in the name of Jesus. There is power when we believe and declare the promises of God over our life. Now is a good time to hold fast to your confession of faith in what God has promised you. Now is a good time to draw a line in the sand and say, devil, you have been trespassing for too long. You cannot have my peace. You cannot have my joy. You will not make me step out of love. You will not make me hate my brother. I will love. I will be at peace. I will be filled with joy. I'll be filled with life. I'll be a carrier of the gospel. Hallelujah. In case you did not know, Jesus is not coming back for a whooped church. He's coming back with a shout. He's coming back with a sword in his hand. He's coming back riding a white horse. He's coming back in victory and triumph. And he's coming back for a blood washed, redeemed, cleansed, triumphant, hallelujah, head held high church. That is me. That is you. That's to all who've called on the name of Jesus, made him Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, you have more authority than you probably realize. Whether you realize it fully or not, there is a dominion and authority that you have that needs to be released from you. In 1 Peter, it says it like this. Everybody say, Pastor Aaron, you're doing a great job. Keep going. Okay. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 9 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Again, humility connected to your authority. That's important. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, just kind of a little side note right here, all right? He says you have an adversary. Listen, you need to be aware that we do have an adversary. Satan's not like some figment of our imagination, not some like, you know what I mean? This is real. We do have an adversary. They're all, they're all principalities and powers. There are rulers that are set up against us who hate the church, who are anti-Christ, anti the body of Christ, anti your marriage, anti your future, anti your health, anti your blessing. We, there's real enemy that we face in case you did not know. We have a real adversary. And by the way, the adversary is not the person on Facebook who you don't like their comments. All right, I'm not saying the devil can't use them, all right? Because the enemy does use people, but we, get to, we need to get to the source here. And that's what he's saying. Your adversary, be vigilant, be sober, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, 
like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Somebody say resist. Y'all see that word again, right? Resist him, steadfast in the faith. One translation says steadfast in your faith. Steadfast in your faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Meaning every brother, every person in Christ Jesus, we're facing the same challenge, same trial, same difficulty, same adversary, same enemy. But he says, be sober, be vigilant, be aware, be balanced, be ready, all right? Because your adversary, who is the devil? He walks about how? Like a roaring lion. Like a roaring. Anybody ever heard a lion roar? Come on, anybody ever been to Alexandria International Zoo? I love our zoo, by the way. It's great. Hadn't been in a while. But if you ever go to the zoo, you got to go to the, you got to see the lions, right? Like you can't go to the zoo and not see the lions. The lion is the king of the jungle. Come on. You got, you got to go, you got to go see the lions. And lions are either chilling, eating, or they looks like they look like, like pacing. You ever seen? It's just, anybody ever been there when they're pacing and just makes you a little bit nervous, like they're waiting to eat you next? And there's like six inches of glass and rock in between you, and you're like, I don't know, I've been to Alexandria National Zoo, and I looked at the glass, I looked at the rock, and then I went around the little fence on the side, and I'm like, I think they could get through that fence. I don't know. One time we went to the zoo with my uh, mother and father-in-law, and, and uh, with our kids were a little bit smaller and we were right at that little spot right there and that line was kind of going back and forth and all of a sudden that line just kind of like kind of came toward the glass and growled came toward the glass was like Whoa! and I'm telling you uh, I turned and I ran so fast I left my children left my wife I knew my mother and father-in-law would be okay hallelujah he carries usually even in the zoo sorry I'm sorry um <laughs> They've lived a long life. They'll be all right. We still got more life left to live. Hallelujah. <laughs> Came to my senses. I'm like, oh, I need to take care of my kids and my wife. Praise the Lord. Right? But that, that roar kind of sent a little chill down my spine. Come on, anybody ever heard that roar? You're like, hey, whoa, I'm glad we're not wherever his home really is. I'm glad we're right next to the park. All right? This is a much better place to be. And I just want you to know that the enemy right now, he's, he's not only trying to, he's not only trying to take your big will, but he's trying to position you into a place of fear. He's like a roaring lion. But you got to know something because this verse is something very important, very powerful that you have to take away when you read it. It says, seeking whom he may devour. I mean, it just kind of makes it very clear that the enemy cannot just devour anyone and everyone that he pleases when he wants to. Because if he could, he would. You wouldn't be here. Whom he may devour. You got to be like, you got to, you all ever heard the story of the kid who was at school? He's at school, and there's this bully at school, and this bully had a list of all the people that he could whoop. He had this list of all the people that he could whoop. So, he, he, you know, this, this kid comes up to this bully, and he's like, um, well, what you got there? He goes, this is a list of everybody I can whoop, all right? And the kid started looking on, the, looking on the list, and he saw his name on there. He said, hey, you got my name on there? He said, I do. He said, take my name off of there. You can't whoop me. And the bully said, well, okay, I'll take your name right off. I'll take your name right off. The enemy's like that, like seeking whom he may devour. You got to be the one. Your family has to be the kind of family that says, hey, there's a lot going on right now, but we will not be devoured. Everything the enemy is trying to do to steal and to kill and destroy, there's a bloodline at my house. We have been redeemed. We are covered. We have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and we will stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whom resist, oh man, this is good stuff. Amen. The Passion Translation says it like this in verse 9. You're really going to like it. It says, take a decisive, take a decisive stand against him and resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. I'm going to read it one more time. It's too good not to. Take a decisive stand against him. And resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. Everything he's trying to do, everything that he brings to the table, that fear, that depression, that brokenness, that sickness, everything that he's trying to do, we resist with strong, vigorous faith. I saw someone telling the story about how lions... Um, that with a lion, you cannot play possum with them and survive it. 
I mean, there's certain animals, they say you play possum with them or you play dead. They kind of like mess with you a little bit and they leave. A video I saw said, you can't play possum with a lion. You will not live through it. <laughs> Now's not the time to play dead. Now's the time to rise up with victorious, triumphant, dominant faith in Jesus, faith in his promises, faith in his word, believing the word of the Lord and declaring that. We have authority that's been given unto us because of Jesus. I went to Bible college at a school called Southwestern Assemblies of God University. Went there four years, got my bachelor's degree. Thanks for all the excitement about that. Um, while I was there, I stayed on campus three out of my four years. And the first two years, particularly um, as a freshman, as a sophomore, it's a, it's a, it's a Christian school, it had some some serious kind of rules. You had curfews. You had to be uh, back to the dorm by 11 o'clock, you know, um, Monday through Thursday. And on Friday night, you could stay, I think, till 1 o'clock, something like that. You know, so they had these rules, you know. And in, in order to kind of enforce the rules, they had these people on your hall called RAs. Have you ever heard of RAs? I'm, I'm thinking that RA stands for residence assistant. Am I right with that? Would I be okay with that? Okay, thank you. Residence assistant. And so one of the things that they would do is just enforce, you know, when you're supposed to be there, not supposed to be there. And every, every day we had what we called chapel. You had to go every day, 10 or 11 o'clock, something like that, usually right before lunch. But 10 or 11 o'clock we had to go to chapel, and you had to be dressed appropriately for chapel, and you had to be dressed appropriately for when you went to class. One of the things you had to do was you had to have your shirt tucked in. Why are you laughing so hard? You had to have your shirt tucked in. I mean, there was other rules too. Like if, if you didn't have a goatee before the semester started, you could not grow one during the semester. For real. If your sideburns got too long and they're like, you're growing a beard. They're like, you need to cut that beard. I'm like, oh, Jesus, God, help me to love you and not rebel right now, God. All right, because I want to punch this person in the nose just like I punched that kid. Hallelujah. But that residence assistant was usually just going to school with us somewhere around my age but he's getting like $500 off of his school bill. You know what I'm saying? Like, so he tells us what to do. And I can remember being in school or about to go to class, about to go to the, the chapel and our RA saying, I'm walking out and I'm about to go to chapel and I got my shirt kind of like, like halfway. Now I'm preaching with my shirt untucked. Isn't that so sacrilegious? So I'd have my shirt like about like that and I'd, I'd be walking out and the RA go, uh, excuse me, sir. I'm like, bro, you're 20 years old. All right, don't talk to me like that. You need to tuck your shirt in. I'm like, it's, it is tucked in. It's not all the way tucked in. I'm like, holy Moses. All right, so I, I tuck my whole shirt in. Now, do you know why I listened to that RA? Y'all looking at me like, why did you listen to the RA? <laughs> because he had delegated authority and power from the school. I really wasn't that concerned about the RA. I really didn't want to get in trouble beyond the RA, Right? I listened to him, even though we could tussle, we could fight. I could get my big wheel guns out, you know what I'm saying? But I listened to him because of the authority that had been given to him. I want you to know something. As the body of Christ and as the people of God, listen, there's an authority that has been delegated to you as part of his body. Scripture says that Jesus is the head of the church. And we are his body. The same authority that the head has, the body has. Now, to be clear, we know you are not Jesus and I am not Jesus. We know that. But as part of his body, there's a delegated authority and power and name that has been given to us that is to be used to enforce the victory that he has gotten for us. Listen, the dispensation, the time that we're living in, it's a fallen world. It's a mess right now because of Adam's sin. Satan is the God of this world. Lil G. Not big G. Lil G. That means there's a lot going on in our world that he is running. When you hear the phrase or the words, God is in control, it's an absolutely true statement. 
However, there needs to be an understanding as to what is going on in our world that God is still in control at the same time, right? Because if God is in control of Las Vegas, he's doing a bad job. If he's in control of Bourbon Street, he's doing a bad job. God isn't controlling everything going on on Bourbon Street. Come on, there's some of you in your life, you know God was not in control of you. Right? However, during this time, there's an authority that's been given to the church to enforce the victory of our God. Amen. And to walk in the power that he has given us. So that we understand just because there's a lot going on in the world that the enemy is trying to run, he's not going to run my house. He's not going to run my life. He's not going to run my joy or my peace. He's not controlling my love. No, I am walking in the authority that has been given to me in Christ Jesus. It is crucial. It is important that in this moment where it seems like every month is another wave of something. Every month there's something else. There's another challenge, another horrific thing, another bad news, another, bad, another thing that's happening in our world. It's important that we don't just lay down in hopes of survival, but as the church that we stand up knowing who we are in Christ Jesus, knowing the authority that we have, and declaring the victory that is ours in the name of Jesus. My challenge to you, my encouragement to you, if I could say it like this, if I could command you, it would be this. be like, use your authority this week. Use the name that has been given to you this week. I, I want to I close with this. Ephesians chapter 1. I know I've just given you some scriptures and I've read them pretty quick, but if you have your uh, Bible, turn there real quick because I want you to see this. In Ephesians chapter 1, we see a prayer, uh, one of the prayers of the Apostle Paul that he prays for the church, group of Christians and believers, of course, here in Ephesus. And this is the prayer that he prays for the church, and it's a prayer that I'm going to ask you to pray this week, every day. How many of y'all can take that challenge? Like every day I'm going to pray this prayer. You've probably seen it before. If you've been around our church family. If you haven't, I want you to see it. Set your eyes on it. And I'm going to pray this for you right now. But when you pray it this week, I want you to make it personal and pray it for yourself. The places where it says us or you, I want you to just kind of change it up. It's not, you know, you're not doing anything wrong with the word by doing that. And, and say me, all right, on the places there, all right? when you pray it this week. So right now I'm going to pray this for you, and I want you to see what he's praying for believers to see and experience. This is what he says, Ephesians 1, verses uh, 17 through 23. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and what is the exceeding greatness. Notice this, y'all. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Verse 22. And he put all things under his feet. Isn't that good news, y'all? And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This prayer here, it's not really for God to do something. It's a prayer for you to see something. Paul's saying, all right, I know you put your faith in Jesus. All right, he's writing to Christians, writing to believers. You're in the family, you're a new creation, born again, awesome. But there's still more that you need to see concerning who God is and the authority and power that's been released to his church. Amen. 
I can almost hear like somebody thinking like, so you're telling me I don't, I don't have to just put up with all that? Listen, here's the truth. There are real weapons that will be formed against you, have been and will be, all right? There's real weapons formed against the church, against our country, against other countries. I mean, it's, it's real, it's legitimate. There's a real adversary, all right? But you need to know the position that you have, the place that you have, and the power that you have to resist and to withstand the attack of the enemy. Let me ask you a question. Why would he tell you to resist him steadfast in your faith if you could not? Think about it. I mean, if you could not resist the attack of the enemy or the temptation of the, I mean, God would just say, you know, just struggle. <laughs> Survive. I'm coming back soon, and he is coming back soon, but, right, just hopefully you live through it. But that's not what he says. He says, resist the enemy. And we saw that in more than one place, didn't we? In James, submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. First Peter, the enemy's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In Luke chapter 10, we have authority, right? There's a dominion that the church is called to walk in. And it's not an arrogant, pompous dominion. It's a, it's a humble authority, knowing that as we submit to God and we yield to him, we are under the mighty hand of God. And it's under the mighty hand of God where there is power and authority that's released to his people. So it's not about like, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm awesome. Look at my power. Look at my authority. Look at me. Ooh, it's, it's not that. It's, it's as simple as waking up in the morning and just declaring the name of Jesus and understanding that anything and everything the enemy tries to bring into my life, all right, I do not have to receive. I do not. Back in the day, you have to, you used to have to sign for packages. Remember that? I mean, sometimes you still do, but not nearly as much, especially if you order on Amazon. They're like, you already signed with your thumbprint. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, we got your Amex. We got your credit card number. Back in the day, you really have to sign for packages, all right? And if you didn't sign for it, they wouldn't leave it. And there's some things that the enemy's trying to drop off at your house. Don't sign for. I ain't signing for that. No, you just take that wherever that, you just take that back wherever you got it from. Amen.